it's one of our PhD students chairing, so I should just make sure that he's doing all right. <laughs> but I'll probably pop in and out because it's quite nice, right? It's easier. You don't have to skulk in the back of the room. You can just turn your camera off, go on mute, and you can go between the rooms multiple times. Right, I shall leave you for now. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, many of the articles or the presentations has been in, enormously interesting. And are they just the result of what you are being arriving up to this moment? Or are you going to work further in order to produce a journal article later? Do you want to answer that, Dries, or shall I, or? Um, I, yeah, well, I'm not sure what what article are you referring to, or? or I think all, I think the ones in the proceedings. I think proceedings. Because um, because I'm I'm just thinking that many of the articles are, are really really interesting, and I am intending to use it as a reference for my upcoming master thesis. However, they are not peer reviewed articles. For this reason, I'm asking you if some of you are intending to publish the as a third Some background noise if someone can turn off. Someone was in the middle of a tumble dryer or something. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to the session just to make sure that that's starting OK. But um, Yuri, I think yeah, the answer is that uh, people usually do uh, develop what they put in, a, in the proceedings uh, and they often do end up in distinct publications. Um, but also you will be able to refer to the proceedings as a as a reference work in its own right as well. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, I think we're all set for uh, this uh, session on scheduling. We have uh, three speakers, three talks. Well, actually four speakers and three talks <laughs> because the first um, talk will have two speakers, which is uh, David van Hulk and myself. Next, we'll have a talk by Chris Potts and the final talk will be by uh, Julien Guillon. OK, well, um, David, if you're if you're ready, yeah. Uh, yes, I can maybe share my uh, screen first. So normally, you should see my slides now. Yes. Hi, hello everyone. My name is David van Bullock, and over the past year, I have been organizing the International Timetabling Competition 2021 together with Tries Gossens, um, Jeroen Belië, and Mortez Davari. Now, the International Timetabling Competition, what is it actually? The International Timetabling Competitions are a series of competitions organized by the Euro Working Group on Automated Timetabling, which aim to promote um, automated timetabling methods. And this year, it was exceptionally also co-sponsored by the Euro Working Group on OR and Sports. Now, the first International Timetabling Competition already dates back to 2002, and was on university course timetabling. And also the next three um, ITC competitions dealt with educational timetabling problems. So we doubt it, the time was right to organize an ITC competition on sports timetabling. Now, why actually sports? Sports timetabling is a relatively young field, and by now several hundreds of publications have been published. But many of these publications read as a case study. Now, obviously, case studies are nice and they have their own advantages. But the problem a bit in sports timetabling is that most of the algorithms proposed um, deal only with one or two specific competitions under consideration. The algorithms are not benchmarked on other competitions, and the problem instances are often not made publicly available because of confidentiality reasons. So right now, there is actually very little insight into what algorithms work, work best for what type of instances 
and there are also no generic uh, solvers. And this is exactly what we try to overcome with the ITC 2021 competition. So the problem that had to be solved in the ITC 2021 competition is as follows. Given is a set of 16, 18 or 20 teams, a set of time slots. The task is then to construct a timetable assigning to each game one specific time slot. And the, sp the scope of our competition was on double round robin tournaments. A double round robin tournament, you play twice against every other team. Once at home and once away. We focused also exclusively on time constraints timetables with an even number of teams. So in this setting, this means that each team has to play exactly once per time slot. And finally, the only symmetry structure that we considered were the phased timetables. So in a phased timetable, you can basically distinguish two parts of the season. In the first part, every team plays once against every other team. And then in the second part, every team plays the return game against the other teams. Now, this is still a quite trivial problem to solve. The challenge in our competition, however, is to deal with constraints. Constraints can be hard and soft. Hard constraints need to be satisfied under any circumstances. These soft constraints, however, have a penalty. You are allowed to violate soft constraints, but this comes at a penalty, and the objective is to minimize the sum of violated penalties while, of course, respecting all hard constraints. Now, we considered five different groups of constraints. The first group of constraints were the capacity constraints. Capacity constraints kind of deal with um, home away statuses of teams in a subset of time zones. For instance, the first capacity constraint might um, fix or forbid that a specific team plays home or away in a given time slot. The second capacity constraints may, for instance, um, require top team and bottom team constraints. Uh, by example, um, forbidding that a team plays more than once or twice against the top teams in its first five games. The second group of constraints were the break constraints. So a team has a break when it plays two consecutive home games or two consecutive away games in a row. For instance, in the timetable in the right, you can see that team one plays home in time slot one and in time slot two. Hence, we say that, a, uh, that this team has a home break in time slot two. And breaks play a very important role in sports competitions. Usually, teams want or, or competitions want to minimize the total number of breaks, which is here, for instance, given by the second break constraints. The next groups of constraints that we, were, that we considered were the fairness and attractiveness constraints. So these constraints um, enforced, for instance, that the difference in home games played was not larger than its predefined uh, value. Game constraints dealt with fixed or forbidden game assignments. And finally, separation constraints required that there was a minimal number of time slots between uh, two games with the same opponents. Now, we made all these problem instances available in uh, the XML format of RobinX. And admittedly, the XML format might be a, com a bit complex at first. However, once you get used to this XML format, um, you have an enormous flexibility to express the wide variety of constraints that typically occur in sports timetable. We also built a website where the participants could download the instances and where they could also validate our instances. So for more details on the XML formats, the constraints and the website, I refer to itc2021.ucan.be or to um, the Robin X paper below. Now we consider three groups of problem instances. We had the early group, the middle group, and the late group. For all problem instances, there was only one final deadline. This means that for the early group of instances, you had a lot of time to solve them. Whereas for the late group of instances, since they were only announced two weeks before the deadline, you had very limited amount of time. We also organized a first milestone. So this gave the participants the opportunity, it was not obligatory, but it gave them the opportunity to submit intermediate results and see how their algorithms were benchmarking against the algorithms of the other participants. 
Now, the question that you have all been waiting for for weeks by now is, of course, how did we generate these instances? Well, as I already said before, um, because of confidentiality reasons, it's quite difficult to get access of real life problem instances. So we had to come up with a way to generate artificial problem instances. And we wanted these instances on the one hand to be real world alike. And on the other hand, we also wanted to cover as many real life aspects as possible with only 45 uh, problem instances. Now, in order to understand how we did this, we first need to explain the concept of problem instance features. So what is a problem instance feature? Well, a feature is nothing else than a measurable property of a problem instance. For instance, when we want to describe the Belgium Jupiler Pro League or the Welsh Premiership um, rugby competition, we might have a look at the number of teams or we might have a look at the symmetry. Is there a symmetry or is there no symmetry? Or we might have a look at the total number of break two constraints. Is there a limit on the total number of breaks or not? And having all these um, features, we can then nicely um, see how these problem instances relate to one another by having a look at the um, feature space. So for instance, in the plot below, we draw one axis for each feature. And then we can see, for instance, that all the instances in the left bottom have a relatively low number of teams. They have no symmetry structure and they have no BR2 constraints. Now to describe problem instances of the sports timetabling literature, we made use of the three field notation of Robin X. So essentially, we introduced one feature for every constraint. For instance, there is one feature describing the total number of hard CA1 constraints, and one feature describing the total number of uh, soft CA1 constraints. Now, of course, if we have a look at all these, um, all these symbols from Robin X, we have a lot of symbols. So that means that we are dealing in a high dimensional space. So what we did was to use PCA, a standard um, dimensionality reduction technique to reduce the high dimensional space to two dimensional space. So in the table above, you can see for a large or for a number of um, instances that we collected the three field notation. And we used these instances to construct the, um, the nice two dimensional visualization in the left. So for instance, here in the top uh, left, you can see the Belgium problem instances. So these are different seasons of the Chipler Pro League. Here you can see different seasons of the um, rugby uh, in Wales. Now then, um, in order for the problem instances of the ITC competition to be realistic, we require that all the projections, of the three field notations, were within this red convex hull. This made sure that they were real world-like. And second, to make sure that our problem instances of the ITC competitions were diverse, in the sense that they covered all the aspects that occur in real life, we also made sure that the projections nicely covered this whole convex hull. So in the feature in the right, you can, for instance, see the red uh, squares. These correspond with the projections of the early ITC problem instances. But the question, of course, remains um, how to generate a problem instance for a given target coordinate in this uh, convex hole. Well, first thing that we did was to undo this principal component analysis transformation. So for instance, in the feature in the left, you can see a target coordinate. After undoing the PCA transformation, you then get the high dimensional uh, three, three field notation for which we need to generate a problem instance. And then we proceeded in three steps. So for instance, if we had to generate this uh, three field notation, we first generated 2,000 home away patterns with at most six breaks per team, or in case that there was a BR2 constraint, at most five breaks per team. And in case there was a capacity three constraint, we also required that uh, there were no consecutive breaks in these patterns. In the second step, we then generated the home away pattern sets and we constructed a compatible timetable. And then finally, we added the constraints around this compatible timetable in such a way that the compatible timetable was a feasible solution for this problem instance. Feasible, but not, not necessarily optimal solution. For instance, if we had to add a capacity one constraint, we picked a random team, a random time slot, and we checked whether this team was playing home or away in the current timetable. And then depending on this, we uh, described the capacity one constraints. So there was only one final thing we had to do. 
we had to make sure that the Prolo instances were not too easy. So for this, we developed a off-the-shelf IP uh, formulation, a constraint programming formulation, and we also uh, solved a quite simple, uh, or we constructed a quite simple fix and optimize uh, heuristic, which we backed up by typical local search operators. And then we made sure that none of the instances um, was solved to optimality within a short amount of time. So I will now give the floor to Dries, uh, who will present the second part of this presentation. So normally, Dries, you should be able to uh, have control now. Yes. OK, I think I'm sharing my screen now. OK, so um, a bit more on the on the rules that we uh, applied, the rules for the competition. Uh, we are much indebted to um, the organizers of previous um, international timetabling competitions um, because they basically developed these rules and we largely copied them. Um, we try to keep the rules as simple as possible uh, in order, well, to make it to make life easy for ourselves as organizers, but also to um, um, well, reduce the threshold that people may have to to uh, to enter the competition. So um, we didn't care about computation time. Uh, basically, everyone got well, all the computation time they wanted. Uh, um, also, because it's quite difficult to measure computation time or or even to compare computation time on different machines. So we didn't care about that. Um, well, of course, sports scheduling problems are not the kind of problems that you solve every day. You typically solve them once per season. So um, computation time is not that important, I would guess. Uh, we also didn't apply any technology restrictions. Anyone could use any uh, software package he or she wanted. Uh, um, so in the end, we did not run any algorithm code ourselves. Uh, the only kind of rule was that the same version of the algorithm must be used for all instances. Uh, our idea is to, to let people develop a kind of general sports scheduling solver. Uh, so it would not be um, interesting if you would develop a separate algorithm for each separate instance. And of course, parameter tuning is allowed, uh, but the idea is that uh, with, with, with the algorithm, you should be able to solve any uh, instance of, 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 of this kind that we would present. OK. Now, a um, few words on the scoring. Um, so um, there was only one deadline. Eh? There were, as, as David explained, early, middle and late instances. There's only one deadline uh, for people to submit their to submit their final result. And then for each instance, we would compare the scores, well, the scores being the objective function value and eh? the, the, the sum of violated soft constraints that we try to minimize. And um, well, if you would um, be the best um, solution for this instance, you would score, if it's an early instance, 10 points. The second best solution would be seven points, the third best five points, and so on. Uh, and as you can see, we increase the weight uh, for the middle and for the late instances. And for the late instances, participants only got about two weeks time to, uh, to compute, uh, whereas the early instances were published months before the, the deadline. OK. And the winner of the competition would then be uh, the team that has the highest total number of these uh, points. OK, um, we were quite happy to see that um, we have uh, 13 participating teams. Uh, to be honest, in the beginning, we were, we were uh, a bit hesitant. I mean, on the one hand, there is the sports community, but not so many people in the sports community are into timetabling. On the other hand, there's the timetabling community, but not so many people in the timetabling community care about sports. Uh, so we were, <laughs> it was a question to us how many uh, teams, how many people would participate. And we were very happy to see that 13 teams uh, participated. Um, many of them, almost all of them linked to, to uh, universities. Um, the teams that you see in bold here, the six teams in bold are the finalists. Uh, they perform best in one of these six is going to uh, win uh, the competition. We're going to announce this in just a few minutes. The teams at the bottom did unfortunately not make it to the final, but also have nice contributions. And I in particular would like to mention the team uh, NHH and Team Zero, because these two teams are students. 
Uh, and I think that's quite remarkable as a master student or undergraduate student to um, to participate in this kind of difficult, tough competition um, where actually all the other research teams have uh, at least one or often many uh, highly experienced uh, researchers. Um, OK. Now, an interesting question, of course, is what kind of methods did all these teams use? And we're still trying to figure out, I mean, very recently, um, eight of these 13 teams have submitted an extended abstract or a paper for the uh, Patat proceedings. Um, but I mean, this is very recent. We didn't quite figure out ourselves in detail what everyone did. But uh, a few weeks ago, we sent out a Google form, a small survey asking every team uh, what kind of approach they followed. Yeah? And this was the result for this uh, survey. Now, note that, that people could uh, indicate multiple um, techniques. That's not just one uh, option per, per team. But if we look at this, we can see that, I mean, many different things have been tried. And um, still, most of the teams had some IP-based uh, approach, or at least an IP at some point played a role uh, in their solution uh, method. Now, oh, um, one of the more important uh, aspects of this um, award ceremony is announcing who wins, right? Um, so let's let's start with that. Um, now, the first uh, thing we're going to announce is who won the milestone result. Uh, so remember, uh, people could, it was not mandatory, but people could send out their in intermediate results in January. Mm -hmm. And then we made a ranking of the results that we received at that point. That would be only early instances because the other instances were not uh, published at that point. And the first milestone was won by Team UOS, uh, University of uh, Southampton. Um, well, this, actually, this is actually old news. The participants of the competition would uh, know this already some time ago. Um, but Team UOS wins. Well, originally we, our prize was a free registration for this MadSport uh, International Conference. Um, but then it turned out that this conference was free for everyone. So that would be kind of a lousy uh, prize. So um, Team UOS wins a free registration for MadSport International next year. Uh, on site in, in, in Reading. Okay, well, but let's then move over to the, um, the final uh, winners and I'll give you the top three. So there are six finalists. And uh, well, let's start with uh, who uh, managed to secure the third place. And that is Team Saturn. Team Saturn from uh, Higher School of Economics um, in uh, Russia by uh, Daniel Sumin and Ivan. Rodin. Um, very well done. They scored 386 points. They managed to find feasible solutions for 37 out of the 45 instances. They had the best solution for 16 out of the 45 instances. Their approach was, I understood, a, a decomposed IP uh, approach. So they went 250 euros and a discount for their registration for Patat 2022 next year in Bruges in uh, Belgium. So congratulations with the third place. Now let's have a look at who ends second. And that is Team Udine. Team Udine by um, Roberto Rosati, Matteo Pretris, uh, Luca Di Gaspero and Andrea Scharf. Um, they win 500 euros and also a discount on the registration for uh, next year's Patat uh, conference with a score of 424 points. They managed to find a feasible solution for all but one instance, which is a very excellent performance. Mm -hmm. They scored only best solutions on four out of 45, but basically this means that they scored consistently high over all the instances, perhaps not the best solution, but very close to the best solution. Their approach is um, uh, similar to the kneeling kind of uh, approach. So congratulations, Team Udine, very well done. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> But Thank you were you. defeated by just one team. And that one team is, I don't have any drums or so, but uh, <laughs> I will not uh, keep you in the tension much longer. That one team that beat Team Udine and all the other teams, that one team that won the ITC competition 2021 is 
team, UOS, the University of Southampton, by Tony Martinez Sicora, Chris Potts, and Carlos Lamas Fernandez. Congratulations, very well done. I would say a round of applause, but that doesn't work <laughs> so very well uh, online, I have uh, learned. Um, excellent result. Uh, 596 points, a feasible solution for every instance that we came up with. Best solutions for 21 out of the 45, that's nearly half. Um, excellent results, I would say, with a fixed and relaxed type of uh, algorithm. So your price uh, is 1,000 euros um, and a free registration for Patat 2022. So I'm looking forward to meeting you guys, well, next year um, on Madsport International and the Patat conference. Uh, so you'll know what, what to do next year. Congratulations. This is the complete list um, of the results. Uh, so you can see the points scored on the early instances, the middle instances and the late instances, and then in column with the total. The total column is what, what counts. Um, so team goal, um, which is related to University of uh, Ouro Prato in Brazil, ended fourth. And team model, which is the research campus model at Zuse Institute in Berlin, was fifth. And um, Eindhoven uh, University team was sixth. Congratulations to all. Um, I would also like to, um, to stress that, in fact, every team performed quite well. I mean, you can tell from the number of feasible solutions. It was definitely not so easy to come up with a feasible solution for uh, for an instance. And as you can see, um, many of the teams, almost all participants, came up with quite a lot of um, feasible solutions. So that's that's very well done. Okay. Now the competition has uh, ended, um, but that's not quite the end of the story because the website and the validator, they remain online. So now we have a set of benchmark instances and we have a set of very good results on these um, benchmarks. So if you're working on um, any type of sports uh, scheduling problem, you have developed uh, an algorithm. It would be only fair to evaluate the performance of your algorithm by comparing it to uh, what our 13 teams uh, have achieved on this set of benchmark instances. Uh, so you can still, um, use our uh, competition website for that. And actually, you can still use the Robin X website, which has a, a repository of, of many real life instances for that as well. Okay, uh, I'd like to conclude by thanking our sponsors, which is the Euro Working Group Patat on automated timetabling, as well as the Euro Working Group OR in Sports. And um, I'm happy to, uh, well, receive any questions or remarks that you may have. Um, or it might also be a good idea to, to uh, give the floor to the, to the, to the winners of the, of the competition, um, perhaps to explain very briefly what it is that they did. Uh, maybe that would be a good idea if, if, uh, if someone of the winning team would be willing to do that. Hello. Not sure. Hello. Do you want to do it, Tony? Hmm. Oh, you can, or you can do it, please. I don't, I don't really mind. Um, you, you'll probably know better about the fine algorithmic details of the code. So uh, why don't you say something? I can add in something at the end if necessary. Hmm. Well, yeah. Can you go to uh, to the to the slide where you had the methods there? Um, Do you know which slide I'm referring to? Yes. Um, yes, that this one. one. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So basically, what we started uh, just giving some some flavor of what we did is is we started uh, formulating the problem using integer linear programming, and then indeed we end up with this uh, uh, the whole formulation, the monolithic formulation. And then starting from there, we, this is the first thing we did. We tried that and, and that, of course, uh, uh, didn't work. So, so we use um, one of the solvers, we use Grovit to try to solve that formulation and it was not feasible. And then from, the, from there, we did some sort of this, this sort of math heuristic where we pick some of the variables and 
and, and uh, well, relax or allow us variables, the, the others. And then based on this idea, we develop neighborhoods changing the way we, we fix the variables. And then we had two stages as well. Of, of course, uh, uh, we start only with the, with the, um, um, with the hard constraints first, because in some of the problems, that some of the problems that were straightforward with the with the constraints, but other problems, it took a lot of time actually to find a feasible solution. So so and then we iterate there, and then as soon as the feasible solution is found, then we try to do a very similar thing, uh, where we go through the different neighborhoods and and um, uh, optimizing the soft constraints, and that's what basically the approach is. And it was it was a very nice thing to do because we there is a learning process. On the, when when you are in the in the competition, so every time you see where the where the issues are, etc. So yeah, but we we stick to that IP idea, yeah. And well, thank you for for for, for the organizers and for all the uh, all the competitors. It was um, it was a, a a nice thing to do. It's a nice it is a nice problem. Great. I hear you get phone calls from the press and the media to uh, to interview you. For the win, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, he's not sure if you want to say something. Um, no, um, not really. I don't really have a lot to add to uh, to what you what you said. I mean, we did. I um, mean, it was a lot of fun doing the uh, competition, and um, it was a sort of regular excuse for us to uh, meet up once a week and uh, drink a few beers. Which that was, was that was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, but also it was a it was a it was a lot of hard, lot of hard work, and we were um, um, running experiments almost continuously on our um, high performance computing cluster at uh, Southampton. So uh, that facility was um, you know obviously very helpful in uh, allowing us to get the some of the solutions, and uh, particularly for I mean I, I think that. One of the things we had the most trouble with was finding a feasible solution of middle two. Yeah. But um, but yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it was um, yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, there's, there are various ways we could um, describe our um, method. Our starting point was an IP uh, formulation, but it had elements of um, fix and relax. It had uh, elements of um, variable neighborhood search in it, and um, yeah, and uh, a whole um, range of um, different. Um, relaxation procedures in the uh, fix and relax part of it hmm. but um but generally applying all these things we were able as the results showed to uh, get pretty good solutions to all of the instances hmm. i think that's all i wanted to say hmm. okay very well done congratulations um there is, I mean, I am also kind of the chair of the session, and I see that the, <laughs> the allotted time for this talk uh, has ended. Um, so I would suggest that if anyone else has a very urgent question, well, to still postpone that perhaps to the end of the session, uh, where we can perhaps in the lunch break continue a bit. But now to switch to the uh, second speaker, and uh, let me perhaps first stop sharing my screen to make that possible. And the second speaker being uh, Chris Potts, who will talk about tournament design for the One Day International Cricket World Cup. Can so, you see my screen okay? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, well, um, I will give this talk rather than uh, go downstairs and uh, open a bottle of uh, champagne to um, celebrate the uh, competition win. Um, so, yeah, um, it's this is about the uh, ICC Cricket World Cup. So uh, we actually did this um, work last year, um, relatively soon after the um, uh, 2019 Cricket World Cup had finished. And um, um, I was I did it, and um, Neil Riley, my um, 
co-author was um, doing this as a project, but as some um, part of his um, studies at uh, University of Southampton. So this is just a rough outline of my talk. So the motivation why we uh, actually looked at it, and that's kind of um, um, mixed up with the uh, sort of history of the um, World Cups, which I'll uh, go through. Um, then we'll um, talk about some um, tournament designs that have uh, been used in the uh, in the past. And um, then I'll describe a um, simulation approach we use for comparing these um, designs, then give the results and then the conclusion. What's happened? OK, is, is my screen still visible? Yes, it is still visible. You're still on the outline uh, slide, slide number two. Yeah. And now you move to motivation. OK, then. So um, historically, the um, World Cup started in uh, 1975 and it's been held approximately every four years. In, in a minute, you'll just see that there are some three year gaps and some five year gaps. But that's because of the uh, cricket in the southern hemisphere, which, you know, where uh, uh, a competition may be held in December of one year or January of the next year. So there's uh, sort of three, some three and a half year gaps and some four and a half year gaps. What's kind of surprising is again, you'll see uh, in the history slides that uh, the format has frequently uh, changed and there doesn't seem after all this time to be a, a sort of preferred format that's emerged um, that's uh, going to be used for more than um, a couple of tournaments in succession. And just to, um, a sort of brief word about the stakeholders involved in uh, the Cricket World Cup. It's obviously um, the ICC organised it, the International Cricket Council, and um, one of the things they want to see is the development of uh, international cricket. So that means um, to uh, adding some teams who are probably not going to win the tournament, but uh, deserve to um, play their games on a bigger stage and uh, uh, have more competitive matches against the better teams, because otherwise uh, the standard of cricket in those countries are not going to improve. Obviously, the fairness of the tournament um, is um, important to the players, but particularly what we were um, focusing on is the spectators and um, I guess sort of TV companies and sponsors who want to see competitive matches. And uh, we um, sort of focus quite a lot on um, what are meaningful matches and what are not meaningful matches. OK, so moving on to the um, history. So uh, the uh, World Cup started off in a sort of fairly low key way where um, the duration of the tournament in 1975 and 79 was only um, a couple of weeks. Um, just eight teams uh, completed and there were 15 matches. So those 15 matches were um, um, single um, single round robin uh, matches uh, where the teams were divided into uh, two groups and then uh, um, semi-finals and finals. And then in uh, 87, um, they changed those single round robins to double round robins. So uh, both the number of matches and the duration uh, increased. OK, and then um, in 1992, the, uh, the uh, number of teams increased by one. That was because South of South Africa was readmitted into the uh, playing into international cricket. So um, there was one extra team. And then there was a bit of a jump um, when it came to 96, where the numbers of teams went up again. And um, um, there were um, for the next um, few years, there were 12 plus uh, teams and uh, teams who were um, are called associate members of the ICC were given the opportunity to play and we had, we had teams like um, Ireland who are not full members of the uh, ICC but um, they had a chance to qualify against uh, similar teams um, and uh, compete in the uh, in the tournament. Um, okay it's um, 
probably um, the, the 2007 tournament was the sort of most criticised because it was sort of quite a long tournament. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, on my next slide about uh, why this tournament wasn't um, wasn't liked uh, very much. And, uh, and then we come up to um, the 2011 and 2015 competitions, um, where, of course, they did have identical formats for um, those two. But for some reason, which I don't understand, is why uh, they went round. They went to um, a different format in uh, 2009, and uh, excluded um, most of the um, teams like Ireland, who were not uh, full members of the uh, ICC. Okay, so the ne next slide is really about the format of the um, um, competition. So some competitions had a preliminary round robin phase and then some teams were eliminated there and then they went on to the uh, round robin phase but most um, 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 teams have just got this uh, main uh, round robin phase you see in the last um, columns you know um, there's no consistent um, pattern about um, whether you have just a semi-final and the final as a knockout stage at the end of the tournament tournament or whether you also have a, um, a quarter final um, just to say a little bit more about 1999, 2003 and 2007, they had this preliminary um, round robin, but um, those teams then going on to the main round robin, some of them had already played each other. So in fact, they didn't play again, and no points from the preliminary round robin were carried forward into the uh, main uh, round uh, robin. So that did help to uh, re uh, reduce the number of games. And I said I would talk a little bit more about the uh, sort of 2007 um, tournaments. So there are four groups of um, four teams, but um, so 16 teams. But then uh, at the end of that short preliminary round, Robin, eight teams were um, kicked out. And one of the problems was in that particular year, the two of the uh, main cricketing nations, um, India and Pakistan, were knocked out. And uh, in terms of, um, sort of worldwide um, TV audiences, they lost a billion or so um, potential viewers when uh, India went out. So that was why the uh, tournament was not reg regarded as a great success, particularly from uh, an economic point of view with um, two um, major countries um, going out. OK, then, so amongst all these um, different um, formats for the competition, um, we um, decided uh, which ones to uh, investigate in more detail and uh, compare using our um, simulation. OK, so a couple of um, um, comments based on this um, history. It seems to have emerged in the recent competitions that um, the duration of the tournament should be a about six weeks, which is probably appropriate for um, cricket matches um, of this type, which um, each lasts for um, a whole day. And um, um, 40, 40 to 50 matches should be played during the uh, competition. Okay, and um, um, I, my view is that um, the 2019 tournament with only 10 teams is not um, sufficient to encourage the globalization of um, cricket. Probably 16 teams is too many because you had um, some teams like um, Bermuda in that uh, 2007 competition and they ended up um, losing um, the matches uh, quite heavily. So probably 12 to 14 teams is the right number of teams that should be uh, competing in the uh, in the World Cup. And um, tournament um, designs need to be compared. And um, one other thing that we decided we would look at um, is to look at different um, possibilities for the um, knockout phase. And uh, another thing is that, um, you know, so that um, teams from the um, uh, more developing uh, cricket nations should have a reasonable chance to um, play, um, we thought they should have at least four or five matches before they eliminated. So uh, 
these um, round robin matches with um, groups of four teams, um, they could be eliminated uh, after three matches, which we didn't think was uh, particularly satisfactory. Okay then, so uh, what we decided to take forward was the 2007 design with uh, 16 teams having uh, initial round robin um, competition of um, four groups with four teams in each. And um, that's reduced to um, eight teams and uh, these play in one group in the main round robin uh, phase. And a design based on the uh, 2015 um, um, competition, where in the uh, round robin phase, um, there's 14 teams starting, divided into two, into two groups of uh, seven teams. And then the uh, for top four teams in each group go into a, uh, a knockout phase. And the most recent um, um, competition, um, two, 2019, so 10, great, 10 uh, teams just in a single um, group. And then there was just the uh, top four teams go through to the knockout phase with a uh, semi-final and a final. Okay then, so I'm, we were thinking about um, a knockout phase for the 2015 format where there's um, two round robins taking place and how should it um, be organized? And uh, doing a search of the internet, we found an article on the, what they called the perfect World Cup format, which referred to the knockout uh, phase of the uh, competition. Okay then, so basically you have um, two groups A and B and uh, let A1 and B1 by the, be the winning teams in each group, A2 and B2, the second teams um, in the two groups, etc. Okay, so this is how, the, um, um, uh, how it works. So MN1 is just a shorthand notation to say um, the winner of match N in this uh, knockout competition. So in the first round, you get the third and fourth teams from the opposite groups um, playing each other. Okay, then in the second, and so, there's, so the whole idea of this um, 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 uh, perfect um, design is that teams enter at different phases of the uh, of the competition. So um, the second day, second place teams enter in round two and uh, the winners of the two groups enter in round three. So in uh, round two, the um, uh, second teams in um, groups A and B play the uh, winners of the uh, first two matches. And similar in the uh, round three, um, the winners of the round two matches uh, play um, A1 and uh, B1, the, the winners of the uh, two groups, in what's essentially a, a semi-final. And, and then the final, of course, is just the um, two winners of the semi-final matches uh, playing each other. So um, I, I think there's a lot of lot going for um, it with this um, type of format because it encourages, um, for example, um, teams to go all out and uh, win their groups because then they have uh, less obstacles in um, getting to the uh, final. And similarly, it's better to um, come second rather than third or fourth in order to uh, play one less match in this knockout round. So uh, this is a, a sort of format that, uh, that I like. Okay, so this is um, this is a variant to that um, um, perfect um, design that I showed on the uh, on the previous side. Again, it's designed for the 2015 uh, tournament where there's um, two groups for the uh, round uh, robin phase. So in this case, um, we um, introduce um, MN plus and MN minus. So MN plus has got the um, same meaning as in the uh, previous slide, but MN minus means that the uh, losing team 
um, is uh, needs to be identified. So the round one is the same as on the um, previous slide, but then we then we deviate. Okay, so in round two we have the um, two winners of um, round one. Uh, the two losers of round one, of course, are, um, eliminate, have already been eliminated. But we also have a match between the, um, the two second place teams. So one nice feature of this is that it allows, um, you know, some of the higher um, ranking teams to play an important game early on in the uh, knockout phase. OK, there's just one match in the um, 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 third stage, which is the winner of um, um, M3. So um, that's really the sort of champion of the um, third and fourth place teams will play the loser of MN. So the uh, losing team amongst uh, A1 and um, A2. And then in the semi-final, um, A1 plays um, uh, the winner of M5. And then um, B1 plays the winner of uh, um, M4, either A2 or B2. And then you, of course, you have the, uh, have the final. So um, in, in some ways, this has uh, also got some nice features in that um, um, A2 and B2 are in, introduced earlier into the, uh, into the knockout. And, um, but the sort of minor disadvantage is that if you think about it carefully, then possibly uh, team A1 has got a slight advantage over team B1. But uh, of course, you could um, actually um, compare the A1 and the, uh, the winners of the um, two round robins. And uh, the one that's got the most points, for example, could be um, um, group A and the one with the smaller number of points could be um, group B. So going on to the uh, main uh, part of it, so the um, the tournaments from 2007, 2015 and 2019, those formats were uh, simulated, but we moved in everything into a 2019 session. So the, um, so the strengths of the teams were as um, in 2019 rather than in 2007 and 2015. Okay, so... Um, each, simu in each um, simulation for a tournament was um, run 2,500 times. So we were able to get, sort of, uh, as well as averages, to get uh, distributions of um, performance. OK, so for each individual match, we um, actually simulated who was going to win that match by drawing a random number. And the probabilities for uh, each individual match, we um, looked at the odds which are available on Betfair just before the start of the uh, 2019 World Cup. So uh, it was quite convenient that we were able to uh, find that in historical records from um, Betfair, you know, some six months after the um, 2019 competition had, uh, had taken place. And I'll just show you what the probabilities um, look like. Um, but um, uh, the probabilities we calculated initially didn't allow for the um, possibility of um, a tie or a no result due to the weather. So we made an adjustment to these. So there's a sort of uh, one or <clears throat> two percent chance of um, um, teams uh, sharing the points for an individual match, either because of a tie or because uh, the match wasn't um, completed. And uh, <clears throat> when we simulated the 2015 uh, format, we also uh, did additional um, um, simulations for the perfect and the proposed uh, knockout um, phases. OK, then um, I won't talk a lot about this. So th these these were the um, odds that were um, set for the uh, individual um, matches. So. Um, Nothing, well, yeah, uh, just a couple, just a couple of small points I'll make. I mean, there was, um, there was quite a lot of changes in the odds in the month leading up to the tournament. And uh, um, initially, I think India were um, sort of more, more favoured than England to actually win the tournament. But uh, as time went on, England became the clear favourites. 
And um, Australia, um, originally it was thought they had um, not such a big chance of winning the tournament, but uh, um, when they started to play warm-up matches and uh, Warner and Smith were reinstated to the, into the team after a, a one-year ban, um, there was a lot of support for the Australians. So that's kind of why they're um, out of order in this uh, rank list. Okay then, so these are the um, these are the results of our simulation. Okay then, so um, these are the um, odds of um, winning the uh, um, these, these are the um, probabilities of winning the uh, World Cup. Uh, the first column of this table uh, indicates odds, the odds taken uh, at the start of the match. We couldn't actually find very good figures for those, although we had um, odds for uh, individual matches. Um, these, I'm not sure quite how close to the tournament these um, odds were for, but anyway, they give um, some uh, representative view of um, how teams were um, favoured to perform in terms of winning probabilities for the uh, overall tournament. And then you have the uh, columns of results for the uh, simulation. Um, and um, for the three different formats and um, what you get if you adapt the uh, playoff um, phase to these uh, perfect and proposed methods that uh, I pointed to. So I've lost my screen. Okay, so um, there's not a huge difference in the uh, different um, chances of uh, winning the uh, World Cup. Uh, <coughs> it is noticeable that um, in um, 2015, this point, 0.28 is uh, less than the 0.31 or, or 0.32 for the 2007-2019 uh, uh, competitions. But when you change the um, playoff method, um, then you um, get figures which are uh, which are comparable. So this is um, this slide is just to um, sort of indicate that um, probably on the basis of the uh, sort of fairness of the competition, there's not a lot of differences between the uh, different formats. But uh, we also classified the um, matches according to their um, to their interest. So there's different um, statuses for a team. So you may have a team in state Q, which means that at this particular stage of the tournament, um, it, the uh, result of the match is not um, important to that team because they've already qualified for the knockout stage. And uh, if there's no incentives about what position they finished in, then uh, uh, the result of the match is fairly unimportant to them. E is a team that's already been eliminated, so there's nothing they can do. So... Um, um, matches involving um, eliminated teams are not really very competitive. And then the best outcome is the um, C, a team is still competing for qualifications, so they're, um, or, or it's going to be um, have an incentive for improving its position. So if it's important whether they finish first or second or third or fourth, then uh, a team is still competitive. So basically, you have these six different types of matches involving uh, sort of pairs of teams uh, ranging from um, 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 two E teams, for example. Um, they've both been eliminated, so that's probably the uh, uh, most boring of the matches from the spectators to watch. Um, and other ones have got uh, matches between two competitive teams where they're both going all out to win. And these are the good matches from a spectator viewpoint. Uh, and these Chris, are the. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you're, you're running out of time. We have three yeah, minutes I've, left. I've, 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 I've that includes finished, questions yeah. as well. So, yeah. I've almost finished, yeah. Okay, great. So, these are the, um, these are the proportions of or percentages of matches in the different um, categories. And uh, I guess the uh, probably the one to focus on is the, uh, is the last row where you have um, uh, matches against pairs of Cs. 
And uh, if you notice in the uh, last two columns, the 2015 with the modified um, playoff phases, then these are the highest figures for um, these um, good matches. So um, that uh, is a pointer towards the uh, 2015 with modified playoffs. Okay, so um, I've already made this point. So uh, it seems good to have um, a World Cup with 40 to 50 matches and duration of about 16 weeks, 12 or 14 um, teams um, competing. And uh, the re results of the um, simulation, well, in terms of fairness, I think they're all pretty similar, but uh, in terms of um, producing um, interesting games, I think the uh, 2015 um, format with the uh, new knockout phase is the, uh, is the preferred one. So I have finished now. Hmm. Thank you. Um, let's uh, go for a round of applause. <laughs> Oh, no, and the final point on the slide was that you could use this um, simulation uh, approach to other sports as well, as well, where there's some, some debate about what formats they should use. Okay. Any questions for Chris? Uh, raise your hand if you have a question. We don't have much time, but we can have one question at least. I don't see any hands being raised, unless I missed something. Last chance. Okay, apparently not. Um, well, but then again, that puts us nicely on track for the third uh, speaker in this uh, session. Thank you, Chris. Um, our third speaker is uh, Julien Rion, who is going to talk about um, an idea that my, my youngest kid actually also mentioned uh, this morning after having seen the path to the finals for uh, Belgium uh, in the Euro Championship, which is choose your opponent, um, a new knockout design for hybrid tournaments. Julien, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh... So I will say good morning because I'm in New York, but probably good afternoon for many of you in uh, in Europe. So let me uh, share this window with you. Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, the invitation to talk at uh, math for international it's of course a bit a pity that it's all virtual this year but i hope we will uh, you know be able to uh, see each other in person uh quite soon and uh if i understand correctly ne next year for the next uh, edition um so i would like today in this uh, scheduling session to talk about uh, a new knockout design for hybrid tournaments that i have dubbed uh, choose your opponents um where uh, well we'll, we'll I'll, I'll explain that uh, in a in a second where basically like uh, the best the teams that have best performed in the you know pre preliminary group stage may choose their opponent in a subsequent uh, knockout uh, round but before i delve into it let's indeed start with like the news from yesterday night that centuries mentioned just a minute ago with the what we learned yesterday night is actually what the bracket of the Euro 2020 will be for the coming uh, weeks. Um, and uh, in particular, yeah, you see that Belgium did not have like such a, doesn't have such an easy path, you know, here Portugal, then Italy here maybe in quarterfinals, and then maybe France or Spain, Croatia, like in, semi, semi, in the semifinals. So it's, it's not an easy uh, path for sure. Um, the thing is that for this uh, version of the Euro uh, with 24 teams, uh, which is the case since uh, 2016, you know you have six groups of four, six is not a power of two, so it's not easy to you know build a bracket, a knockout bracket starting with the round of 16 with uh, six uh, groups. You see some of the group winners, like group winners of uh, 
could D here, play against, so that was the bracket of the Euro 2016, play against uh, third place teams, other group winner, like here play against uh, runner, runners up. Uh, you also have like, of course, a runners up, they play against group winners or they play against other runners up, this kind of thing. And so you see in particular in the, at the bracket of the Euro 2016, when I looked into it, uh, it was shocking to me that there was a group, like for instance, the group A actually, and that was the group where France had been placed arbitrarily because it was the host at the time, had actually three advantages. You see like, for instance, the winner of group A would play a third place team in the round of 16 instead of a runner up. Uh, like for instance here. Um, then in case they advance to the quarterfinals, they would play against a runner-up right here, uh, as opposed to, for instance, here, where once he did play against a third place team, but then the winner here play can play against another group, uh, another group winner, right? Which is the uh, one E, one E in that in that case. Uh, so that's a second advantage. And the uh, Third advantage, if you were in group A, is in case you actually finish second of group A, you actually play against another runner-up as opposed to uh, a group winner, right? So you had group A with three advantages. Let's look at group E. Uh, the winner of group E doesn't play against a third place team, but a runner-up, so it doesn't have the first advantage. If they advance, they play probably they can play against another group winner, which would be one C. So they doesn't they don't have the uh, the second advantage either. And if you actually finish second of group E, you would actually play not against another runner-up, but against a group winner, right? So group E had none of the three uh, advantages. And actually, so I uh, suggested using like the a new uh, uh, knuckle bracket uh, that would minimize group advantage in the sense that no group would have all of the th three advantages and no group would have known of the three advantages, right? And that's like, and I actually convinced you, UEFA to use it for this uh, Euro, Euro 2020. And so that's the uh, the one you have uh, here. And so that's actually the one that's, that's being used uh, this year where you can actually check that there is no, so for instance, if you look at 1C, you can say, okay, they play against the third place team. Uh, then if they win, they play against the runner up in the quarterfinals. So they have two advantages, but then, Let's look at 2C. 2C is here. You see 2C doesn't play against another runner-up. They play against a group winner. So just, they just have two of the three advantages. And you can check that for all the groups, uh, that's the case. Actually, the small price to pay is that now you have, like instead of the traditional three possible uh, groups for the, where the third place teams come from, you have actually uh, four of them in two uh, places here and here, which means that there was like an, uh, around 10% probability that actually you have like a repeated matchup in quarterfinals, for instance, if uh, the group winner of group A advances and also the, this is the third place team from group A and they also advance, so, which was impossible before, but actually will not be the, the case this year, we know from uh, the results of, uh, of yesterday. <clears throat> All the details in this uh, paper, what a fair 2014 U UFA Euro could look like that I published in Journal of Sports Analytics um, two years ago, three years ago, in, uh, in 2018. Okay, so that was just for a short digression in the beginning of my talk, but let's go back to our main, I mean, maybe and unless somebody has a question for this short digression in the introduction that I, that I can take now, please let me know in that case. Otherwise I will actually, yeah, otherwise I will actually jump to the main topic of this talk, which is to choose your opponent. And choose your opponent means that basically uh, the teams that have performed best during a preliminary group stage, like the one that we've just uh, seen in the Euro this year, can choose their opponents during the subsequent uh, knockout uh, stage, knockout round. And so it can be seen as a, a, a sort of reversed draft, right? Where the, the, the best group winners can, can actually choose uh, uh, their opponents in that case. So, so that case. Um, and of course, for instance, that would have been quite interesting for Belgium. Actually, I haven't checked, so, but Belgium you know, has, has won their, their three games in the group stage. So maybe, you know, if they had a choice uh, to pick their opponent in the group of 16, probably they wouldn't have picked Portugal. And, you know, that, that would, and then, and then in the next round, if they advanced, they would not have probably picked, you know, Italy if they, if they advanced as well, because they have won their three games too. So that's also something that, of course, could be used for the Euro. Uh, so the main benefits of this uh, choose your opponent uh, design is that well, first it's very simple. The rule is extremely simple. 
Uh, it essentially solves the incentive, incom incentive <coughs> compatibility problem that was identified by uh, Vong in this uh, paper in 2017, where Vong actually, because it actually the, the, the method effectively cancels the risk of uh, tanking, even in the classical case where in each group you have several teams that advance to the knockout, not knockout stage. Uh, that makes the group stage more exciting because it gives teams a strong incentive to perform at their best level, even if uh, they have already been qualified after, you know, before the last uh, match day. So, for instance, this year, the Netherlands at the Euro, they, they knew that they would finish first in their group after uh, the, the second game. And, uh, you know, it, it happened that they actually won also the third game, but, you know, they, they, they didn't have any win incentive in the, in the, in the last game. Of the group stage uh, and it also makes the group stage more fair by limiting the risk of collusion and making sure that the best group winners are fairly uh, rewarded we'll see that uh, in this short executive summary i also mentioned that advancing teams would choose their opponent during new and you know probably much anticipated anticipated tv shows that would attract a lot of uh, media attention and that also introduces new uh, element of strategy that i think very is very interesting and could change the competition uh, dynamics because then it would be like you know who 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 do you choose uh, it's uh, it's 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 something that uh, this strategy component is not is not present uh, in, for now and I will illustrate this with the round of 16 of the Champions League uh, but of course this can also be adapted to you know maximize some objectives so for instance maximize the number of uh, home games during the knockout stage of the current uh, euro so that's something that is also in the in the paper that I won't cover today. So let's start with the flows of the traditional hybrid tournament uh, design. So here I'm presenting like the cl classical bracket for the knockout stage. So for instance here, that's the 2018 uh, FIFA World Cup. So in that case, you have eight groups of four, eight is a power of two. So that's easy to build like uh, you know, um, a knockout uh, bracket in this way, where you see here the winner of group A plays against the runner up of group B. And then in the quarterfinals, is the, the winner will play against the winner of C1 versus D2, and so on and so forth. You see, that's the one uh, that is that is uh, here. So, what are the, the main flaws of this uh, hybrid uh, tra traditional hybrid design? So, actually, so as I mentioned, like just a minute ago, Vong in his uh, 2017 paper has actually shown that in this classical design. So, classical design means that you know the the, the, the you have like predetermined uh, roots in the in the knockout brackets that are completely determined by the group label and the rank in your group. Okay. Uh, in this uh, classical design, in order to exclude completely the risk of tanking, it's both necessary and sufficient to allow only the top ranked team in each group to advance. So that will only be one the group winner advancing. But of course, that's not you know that's typically not what is done, and that's not good because then you you may have like a lot of uh, uh, stakeless uh, games in the in the group stage. Uh, so there are famous examples. Maybe the most famous example is this badminton tournament at the 2012 Olympics in London, where four teams were ejected from the competition for, here I quote, not using one's best efforts to win a match and conducting oneself in a manner that's clearly abusive or detrimental to the sport that was according like, to the organizer of the, the Olympic tournament. And this happened after uh, round robin matches. Uh, in the previous evening, where uh, the teams were accused of trying to lose in order to manipulate the knockout bracket. So it happened, it actually happened that two teams actually wanted to lose to be in just one half of the knockout bracket that they actually deemed favorable uh, to them. Another example more <clears throat> recent was like at the 2018 World Cup. Maybe you remember this uh, last match day game between England and uh, Belgium, where it was actually quite clear that if you lost that game, you would end up in an easier half of the of the of the bracket. Um, so I also mentioned here, like the papers by uh, Laszlo Sato and uh, Dmitry Dagayev, who have um, uh, studied a lot the, this risk of uh, tanking in, in tournament design. Uh, and a second main flow is the risk of collusion. Uh, we have many examples of uh, collusion. Uh, so here, only in, uh, in soccer, but of course in sports in, in general, maybe in soccer, the most famous example is what is called the, the disgrace of uh, Gijon, where West Germany beat Austria 1-0 in, in the 1982 World Cup, actually. So uh, uh, in the same group, actually, the, uh, Algeria had uh, 
uh, played the day before against uh, Chile, if I remember correctly. And so it, it was clear uh, that uh, a one nil or two nil win by West Germany would qualify both teams at the expense of Algeria. And actually, West Germany scored early uh, in the game. And then the following 80 minutes were just like, you know, two teams refusing to attack each other. And that was like a very poor uh, spectacle. So after that, actually, FIFA decided that the last two games in the groups of four in the, in the uh, group stage uh, would actually be played exactly at the same time to decrease the risk of collusion. It does not completely eliminate the risk of collusion, but it decreases it a lot. Uh, so I've also uh, written a paper uh, about it, like that's mainly about like the uh, the new uh, tournament design that is that is uh, planned for the 2026 World Cup with groups of three. So with groups of three, the risk of collusion is actually uh, uh, very very is much higher. Um, and uh, and so we, here we have also examples where even in groups of four, actually. Uh, uh, you may have like uh, uh, a risk of collusion. So, for instance, in 2018 at the FIFA World Cup, maybe you remember that game between Denmark and France, where it was clear that whatever the result of the other game between Peru and Australia, uh, a draw between Denmark and France would let both teams advance. And actually, it was the only uh, goalless game in the tournament, and like a very uh, you know a, a poor performance from the two teams who basically refused to to attack uh, each other. Uh, here, I'm mentioning uh, other. Uh, example, um, uh, and this is and this is something that is yeah, clearly due to the the, the traditional uh, hybrid design of, uh, of, uh, of of tournaments. So you have many other examples of uh, collusion in this paper by uh, Kendall and Linton in uh, 2017. So you can see in the in the reference uh, references at the end. And the last two main flaws that I want to uh, mention of traditional hybrid design is the absence of win incentives. So I mentioned this a bit earlier. So for instance, some teams may have secured the first place of their group before the last group game. So I mentioned the Netherlands this year at the at the Euro, uh, recently also at, at Euro 2016, it was Italy. And actually, so Italy played their last group uh, game against Ireland and they actually lost because they sent their B team. And actually Ireland qualified following this win. So you can argue that actually by not, you know, sending their best players uh, to play the, the last game. The Italy had distorted the results of their, of their group and the, and the fairness of the competition. This also happened with Brazil and the Nigeria at the 1998 uh, World Cup, and they actually also lost their, their last uh, group game, all of them. Uh, and finally, group winners may feel that they are poorly rewarded in these traditional uh, designs. Uh, because they can be paired with runners-up that they would not have picked if they had if they were given the choice. So that's again, for instance, the example of maybe Belgium this year, or maybe England also this year, because they're going to play against Germany. Probably they wouldn't have picked Germany. Uh, so they can feel poorly and unfairly rewarded for winning for winning their group, and that's also something that happens quite often during the round of 16 of the UEFA Champions League. But of course, in the Champions League, it's a bit different because in that case, tanking is clearly not an option because the the bracket it does not follow like those predetermined routes that are here, but there are actually there is a draw to um, uh, pair group winners and uh, runners. -up. So let's uh, look into the choose your opponent knockout format now. So how does it work? So uh, the teams okay that have performed best during the preliminary group stage can now choose their opponent during the subsequent knockout stage. So first, what we would do is that we would rank the two to the power n teams. So let's say if you have a round of 16, that would be the 16 teams that are uh, qualified to, uh, to the, for the knockout stage uh, based just on the group results. So from one, let's say in this example, from uh, <clears throat> we will have the, the best uh, group uh, winners, let's say in the simple case from one to eight, and then we will have the runners up from nine to uh, 16. And number one would be the group winner with the best, you know, record in the in the knockout stage in terms of, you know, number, for instance, in soccer, number of points, and then uh, goal difference, and then number of goals scored, and so on and so forth. So at this stage, you could think of this following ideal bracket that is here. Okay, that's the classical one where the best group winner, so number one plays against number sixteen, and then uh, in the opposite side, number two plays against number fifteen, and then number three here plays against number fourteen, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the ideal bracket where basically you would have like one versus two in final if the logic is respected, and you would have one versus four and two versus three in the semifinals and so on and so forth. 
Uh, but the thing with this uh, bracket is that, for instance, let's say if uh, if UEFA UEFA had used, for instance, this bracket at the Euro 2016, then it would have looked like this. So you see, actually, team uh, the second best group winner was Germany. Uh, the team 15 was Portugal. Okay, and so you would have had like a, a round of 16 game, like Germany versus Portugal, and Germany would have, you know, probably feel felt like you know not well uh, rewarded for the for the great uh, group stage. Uh, performance by having to play against uh, Portugal. Portugal, of course, is a you know, soccer powerhouse. Actually, Portugal ended up winning the tournament uh, that year. Uh, and so this ideal bracket is actually, you know, not so ideal, actually, in, 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 in practice. Okay. And so we have here example of uh, poorly rewarded group winners. For instance, I remember Brazil having to face Argentina in the round of 16 of the 1990 uh, World Cup. Argentina had finished in third place of their group. And in the Champions League, you have, for instance, Arsenal and Napoli, Napoli having to face Bayern Munich and Real Madrid in the round of 16 of the 2016-17 Champions League, or Tottenham and Paris Saint-Germain, who are actually the best two group winners in 2017-2018 and having to face uh, Juventus and uh, Real Madrid in the round of 16. So, you know, not, you know, not, not really what, I mean, not, not a great win incentive in that case. So in the full choice implementation of choose your opponent, actually the team number one, so the best group winner, would actually choose <clears throat> their opponents among all the other teams, like including other group winners, for instance. And then after they've cho chosen their team, then team two, if it has not been already picked, then will choose their opponent among the remaining teams. Okay, And then team three, if it has not been already picked, choose their opponent among the remaining teams and so on and so forth. So it's really just you pick your opponent among the picks that are teams that are available to you. In the restricted choice implementation, that probably would be more natural in many uh, uh, for many sports, uh, you would actually protect, let's say, for instance, the group winner, or actually the first, the better half of the advancing teams, right? And uh, so the, the the teams one to, let's say, two to, to the power n minus one, so let's say one to eight in my example, could only choose their opponent among teams nine to 16. Right, and so team one does. Uh, they, they, they pick their team among this, the weaker half of the advancing team, and then team two would choose their opponent among the remaining teams in the weaker half, and so on and and so forth. I will I will use an example with the the Champions League in the in the last uh, uh, three four minutes of my talk to make this very clear. And for subsequent rounds, actually, you the same choice procedure would be applied. So the easiest way to apply it would be just frozen rankings. So basically, you just use the rankings from the group stage, and you don't change them. And that could that the, 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 the picking procedure would use those uh, frozen rankings. But of course, it makes sense to update the rankings based on the results of the different rounds of the the knockout stage. So you could simply, like for instance, in soccer, like you have you have one more round of knockout stages, the round of sixteen. Then you have eight teams that advance. So for those eight teams you would take into account their results in the round of 16 by just basically adding three points for a win and, you know, zero point, and, and uh, there cannot be a loss because if they lost, they, they don't advance, like three points for a win, but maybe only two points for a win, you know, after extra times or on penalty or things like that. Okay. Uh, one could also consider updating ranking version where the strength of the opponents that the team has eliminated in the past knockout rounds are taken into account in the in the ranking okay and that would actually lead to interesting strategic debates because should a team pick an easy opponent to maximize the chances that it advances to the next round or maybe select a stronger opponent which decreases the probability of advancing but would improve the ranking in the following round if it advances so this could be implemented using a dynamic elo elo like uh, rating system uh, for instance uh, possible variations of the choose your opponent policy are the following, like a team may choose like whether they play the first leg at home or away in the case of, you know, a two leg uh, uh, round. Uh, the up, they can also choose the opponents of other teams, for instance, or a set of possible opponents for other teams. Actually, this, the set of possible variations of this format is, uh, is huge and can, you know, uh, bring like quite a, a funny uh, a, a tournament design. Uh, actually, the choose your opponent can also be used in the draw of the group. So typically, you know, imagine that you have a tournament with n groups and n seeded teams that are ranked from one to n according to you know from past performance uh, 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 coefficient. Uh, so first, all the unseeded teams would be drawn into the n groups. You have, so usually this is done within a single system of pods with the objective of achieving like a good a good group balance. And then the n seeded teams 
would be allowed to pick their group in order. So team one would pick, would choose one of the n groups, okay, and then team two would choose one of the n minus one remaining groups, and so on and so forth. And here, as you know, typically you have like restrictions in those uh, draws, like for instance, like a CD team may only be allowed to choose a group in which all the teams come from a different country, if you're thinking, for instance, of the of the Champions League. And that's actually a very good way of rewarding the highest ranked teams. And, and on top of that, ensuring like a, a very good group balance because it's quite clear that you know the best uh, city teams would probably pick the, the the groups that are weaker and 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 the, the weaker group winners, the one that arrive at the end, of the, they are, they only have the last choice. They would end up with uh, groups that are actually quite strong when you look at everything except the city team. So that's that's good in terms of building uh, balanced groups. Uh, there are there have there has been uses of uh, choose your opponent in the past in Austrian ice hockey league the playoff pick since the 2012-2013 uh, seasons in the Southern Professional Hockey League in the in the US in two seasons here uh, the English rugby league actually uh, so not rugby but rugby league applied it under the name club call but only for the semifinals in in those five years that are here and the format has also been uh, used in Finnish ice hockey league bridge chess uh sailing okay and also in the uh, online battle arena video game that's called the uh, dota 2. Okay. but uh it seems that it's never been used in the most popular popular tournaments and it could be used you know in you know soccer football basketball baseball handball basketball volleyball rugby tennis cricket you see whole like all the most popular sports tournaments they would actually be able even tennis with the atp finals they could use this uh, this, uh, this form of cricket as well uh, the main benefits is that you virtually have no no tanking. It's not mathematically true that that completely eliminate tanking, but in all realistic cases, if you know a team wants to you know maximize an objective like probability of winning the tournament or probably of, of reaching some given knockout round, with such a system, you cannot have like tanking realistically. And so, for instance, the 2012 Olympics badminton tournament scandal would have been avoided with this uh, with this. Um, formula with this design. It maximizes clearly the win incentive during the group stage because even if you know that you're already first, that you will finish first in your group, you want to be among the best group winners. So uh, you really want to win all your group matches so that you have like, you know, the first pick or one of the first picks. Uh, decreased risk of collusion because of course teams would be less tempted to collude because again, it's, you know, you really want to uh, not only finish first in your group, but like one of the best group winners. And of course there would be like, yeah, those, I think in terms of the media and for the fans, that could be like very exciting because you would have all those exi exciting TV shows uh, that uh, would where the, uh, that would schedule that would be scheduled right at the end of the group stage and where the teams would pick uh, their opponents and the picking strategies of the team would certainly be much commented about upon and much debated uh, in the media and uh, and among the the fans. Uh, the drawbacks i'm taking care of the time uh dress i'm looking at it <laughs> uh, the main drawbacks are maybe the, the sch some scheduling issue in for for tournaments in which a minimum number of rest days is guaranteed to all teams between two games and in which match days and knockout runs are typically spread over several days to maximize tv exposure and the value of uh, media rights which is when you can think of the uh, the, 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 the World Cup or the Euro, for instance, for soccer, and tournaments that also must be played over a short period of time, you have a scheduling issue because actually the, the choose your opponent design might lengthen uh, the, the tournament. Uh, you have also some travel plans and logistics issue because all advancing teams would have to wait until the end of the round to know whether they where where they would play their their next game. And so if you have like tournaments that must be played over a short period of time and in distant cities, like typically, let's say the World Cup, maybe done in, in 2022 because Qatar is, a, is small, but in general, this can be seen as a drawback because then teams and fans would have less time for planning their trip to the, for the, for to the, to the, to the next game. But you can note that actually picking teams could also be allowed to choose the city or stadiums where they, where they play their next game. Uh, the first pick teams might feel offended or humiliated, you know, but at the same time, it's a great incentive, you know, to prove their pickers wrong. Like, you know, oh, you think I'm actually the, the weakest team uh, in the in, 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 in the knockout round? Well, let me let me prove you wrong. OK, so that's 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 not such a big disadvantage. Uh, when I actually uh, discuss with the people at UEFA about this and some of them are really you know, big fans of the, 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 the idea. Uh, one issue that was raised is that maybe in clubs, for instance, for the Champions League, no one 
would want to take the responsibility uh, for the pick. But I think it's not such a big deal because even if you don't want to, you know, make a pick, you can always organize your own draw. Okay, and the draw can be completely uniformly distributed if you don't want to make any choice, or maybe if all people think that okay, we just want team team A or B and not the other. And let's say if two thirds of you know a club wants opponent A and just one third wants opponent B, then you can just organize a draw with three balls, just two balls A and one ball B, right? So you can just organize your own draw in this way if you want, and that's 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 an easy solution to the problem. And also in the case of full choice implementation, so in instance, if team one picks team five. Okay, and then team six has some choice because it has not been picked. Then you know team five might might may feel aggrieved. So this is something, but that, that I don't think that's a big uh, big problem. But it's important to note that in this system, the group winners would be compared across groups, and so <clears throat> it's crucial that the groups be uh, well uh, balanced. Actually, for to me, that's a benefit because that that means that in this system, the groups must actually be well balanced, and that's in any way something that we want. You know, in a in a competition, so that would. Uh, we, we, that this, using this format would ensure that this, that, that uh, group balance is uh, is, uh, is guaranteed. And maybe in the last two minutes, if you allow me, I will just take this simple example with the Champions League 2017, 2018. You see here, like the results, the actual results, were the group winners on the left hand side, the runners up here on the uh, right hand side, and this is actually the round of 16 of the UEFA Champions League. And in particular, you see that the best two group winners, Tottenham and Paris Saint-Germain this year, they actually had to face Juventus and Real Madrid, who finished like second in their group. And of course, they are, you know, they are very strong uh, uh, soccer clubs. And certainly Tottenham and Paris Saint-Germain, you know, didn't uh, uh, feel well uh, rewarded for their great group stage uh, performance. Okay. Uh, so you see here, we, I will use a choose your opponent version that I adapt to the classical UEFA uh, 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 rules. Uh, in, in, for instance, um, a, a, a team cannot choose another team from the same country and that was in the same uh, group. Okay, So that's, that's uh, exactly how it's done today for the draw of the round of 16 of the Champions League to make sure that a team's choice is acceptable. It, that means that it doesn't lead to a dead end. A computer program would provide the list of admissible opponents ahead of each pick. So actually, each year, you know, I uh, I post on Twitter like the probabilities of the round of 16 uh, games, and actually using like a, a backtracking uh, algorithm that actually does does this. Uh, just one minute. So this is how it would work in that case. You see, so for instance, Tottenham is the best group winner. Uh, it cannot play against Chelsea, that you see here, because that's an English team as well. It cannot play against Real Madrid. So here I'm using only the restricted versions, where the group winners can only choose uh, runners-up. Cannot play against Real Madrid, because both teams were in Group H. Okay, so this is formidable. And let's say, for instance, that... So actually, you see, like, Tottenham can only play... Uh, to pick Bayern Munich, Basel, uh, Shakhtar Donetsk, Juventus, Porto Sevilla. Let's, let, let's say, for instance, that it picks uh, Basel. No offense for our Swiss friends. Uh, then um, Basel is now great because it's been picked. Then now it's Paris Saint-Germain's turn. Paris Saint-Germain, of course, cannot pick Basel because it has already been picked. Cannot pick uh, Bayern Munich because they were in the same group. So they can only pick the blue teams that are here. Maybe they choose Shakhtar Donetsk. Again, no offense to our Ukrainian friends. Uh, and then it's Manchester City's turn. Cannot pick Chelsea because it's another English team. Cannot pick the teams, of course, that have already been picked. So only the five blue teams that are here. Maybe they pick Porto. And so and so, and then it's Manchester United turn. Manchester United can play, of course, against a great team and against Chelsea because it's an, it's an English team. So only the four blue teams that are here can be picked. But for instance, they pick Sevilla. Barcelona can only pick Bayern Munich and Chelsea because actually all the others are great. Or Juventus was in the same group, and Real Madrid is another Spanish team. So it's only Bayern Munich or Chelsea. Let's say they pick Chelsea, and then it's Besiktas turn from Turkey. They can only choose. Munich, Madrid, or Juventus. For instance, they pick Juventus, and then that will end up with Liverpool having like a choice between Bayern Munich and Real Madrid. So not so easy. Maybe they pick Munich, and then in the end you end up with the last two teams, which are Roma and uh, Real Madrid, right? And in the end, you see when you compare in the uh, the, the actual uh, round of 16 was this one, and the one with choose your opponent in this example that I picked was this one, where you see now you know, Tottenham and Paris Saint Germain are much uh, well rewarded for their group stage performance. And actually, the teams that finished, the soccer powerhouses that finished second, like Juventus and Real Madrid, now they have to uh, probably face a, a more difficult uh, game, for, for example, for, for Real Madrid as well. Uh, and uh, so I published actually this idea in the, for the French uh, uh, speakers and, and, and readers in Le Monde in December 2019. 
and also in 442 in uh, December 2020. Uh, and the, all the details are in this preprint uh, that I posted in November 2019 on SSRN. And this is a list of uh, references, including the ones that I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk. I've been a little bit long. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. And I want to thank, by the way, Dries, because Dries had like very good comments on an early version uh, of this uh, paper together with actually Fritz Spixma. So thank you very much, Dries, for your comments that are always like uh, very enlightening. You're very welcome. I see that uh, Alex uh, Krumer has a question, so um, please go ahead. Hi, Alex. Hi, hi. thank you, Julien. Uh, an excellent uh, idea, very nice paper. You know, I told you this uh, last year as well. Um, well, first of all, I was unlucky to be in this Denmark friends game in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I know I'm what very sorry about it. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Anyway, um, uh, I really like it, but I want to be the bad guy here, and I want to challenge you with two questions that I'm struggling with. Sure. There are two possible problems. The first problem is there is maybe some collusion that depends on some other tournaments. Let's say last time I won against you and you were very nice so this time i will pick you but you're gonna lose so that's the first possible problem of collusion and the second problem is that now players may you know there is demand and there is supply let's go to pure economics now and uh, you are saying that well people will love it more i agree with you but the question is whether players they may claim now that look we will be tired we will not have enough energy towards the finals because you caused us to to exert more efforts during the whole group stage instead of the previous situation where we could rest a bit so how can you address these two points okay uh yeah so for the first point i mean let's say it's true that at, at the moment when a team or a player picks another team or another player okay so it's true that they can actually um you know interact with each other and so there can be like some dynamics of indeed okay or i don't know you pick me this year and then i pick you the next year and then you we you know we agree on something like something that uh that's true that that's a possible uh drawback of the honestly i i i don't really see it as a realistic situation myself um I, 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 as of now, I don't really see how in the design I could prevent this because here the design is really like, you know, complete free choice, like, uh, it's not based on, you know, what, um, possible like private interactions between the teams of the players. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so I, yeah, so I don't have a good answer to your first point, except that I find that it's quite unlikely that this would happen because who who would really like you know agree to you know lose? Um, no, this I yeah I, I just find it quite like unrealistic. Uh, for your second uh, question, um, somehow if you want, if you're a tournament organizer, yeah. So your objective is that you know you have the maximum win incentive, and that actually you know players and teams they exert the, the, the biggest effort like in in in, in every game. Um, so uh, yeah, so then I would say, well, yes, of course, you you we are actually maybe going from a system where there was like this flow where in some situation you didn't have to exert your maximum effort. Now we actually have, in our point of view, a better system where actually you have like the maximum win incentive in every game and so you have to exhaust your maximum effort in every game which is what we want us of course you're not happy with that but you know then <laughs> then don't sign up for you know a career in this professional sport if you want because you know that's yeah that's 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 a game uh let's say yeah that's clearly a game between the the tournament organizer who wants you know players to max to exact maximum effort and maybe players i understand them where you know they want you know some time some games where you know they can maybe yeah the be, be not, you know yeah not not exact maximum effort and you know you know just rest a bit um well this i'm i'm i also don't see really it as probably in the sense that you know i'm i'm clearly here rooting for best 
uh, tournament design and in that case I'm, I'm, I'm I want you know maximum win incentive and and what I want to uh, make sure that all the players exert that maximum effort so then yeah I'm just completely rooting for that and I, I'm sorry for the players but <laughs> you know just, I, just an intermediate uh, remark that the tournament designer may have several uh, goals that cannot meet each other <clears throat> that is, yeah I yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely I understand that. Here I'm, I'm so that's, here, here I'm really, you know, um, taking the point of view of the tournament organizer who really wants to maximize that. But, but I agree that if you have like I don't know, a central planner or something like that who wants to, you know, or yeah, or let's say that even like objectives are more collective. Yeah, then then uh, your point is absolutely valid. Yeah. Okay, there are two other questions. Um, well, I don't know who was first, but let's let's start with Rue. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Guillaume, for this uh, Julien, for this talk. Uh, it's very interesting. I was thinking you mentioned the word powerhouse a few times uh, in the uh, talk, and uh, well, suppose that in every group there is one powerhouse and one lesser team. So if you go if you go to your Champions League example with Besiktas, for instance, and uh, Basel and everything, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, in a pool, then probably a team. Like Besiktas, who is, I don't, well, not to offend him, but they're not really a powerhouse, right? That's correct. But they finished say. first, uh, hard fought against, I don't know, Bayern Munich or something. <laughs> and then, uh, every, but yeah, they're not likely to finish high up in the group winner ranking as they have to play this powerhouse twice in their group. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, so they'll probably be somewhere in the second part of the first Mm -hmm. tier, whereas Bayern Munich and Real Madrid will be in the first part of the second tier. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I my guess would be that they, if they are there where they have to make their choice, then there's not much left except for powerhouses that just didn't make it to the first section. That Yeah, that is, so that is true. They don't really get rewards for finishing first uh, in this sense. That is true. Uh, that is true. Um, at the same time, say okay. okay so, um, <coughs> yeah. Let's say. Um, okay. So in that case, okay. Uh, yeah, that's. Not, I agree with your point. Um, and but that's that's indeed all. That's the thing with you know uh, results just of you know the group stage of that year and what you know about the team, like even the fact that they're you know so they're powerhouses. So for instance, indeed, uh, and that's okay. So let me make that point. Um, this is this is happening because since mostly since because 2015 UEFA has changed the seeding rule for the group stage. And so now, you know, like pot number one, which is supposed to be the, just the best teams based on the UFA coefficient. Now they're actually the winners of the domestic leagues of the best eight leagues. So actually more, you have like, you know, also the, uh, the title holder that goes there. So, but let's say for, to simplify, it's the, the champions of the best eight leagues. Uh, and so in that case, you have in, in pot number one, you, also, you have, you know, teams that are not so strong, like for instance, like, you know, the, uh, the winner of the Russian league, or maybe the Dutch league, yeah. or that, that are usually that is good. And so that means that in pot number two, you have actually uh, a lot of those teams, like you know, uh, I don't know, Madrid or Barcelona, or you know, very strong uh, 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 English and, and Spanish teams, for instance. And they actually end up with very strong groups where you have actually there's a, a bigger chance of one group having you know, like two very strong clubs because one has won their league, the other has not won their league, but they're very strong. And so that 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 means that you have those teams here that let's say if you had a better seeding would probably be in here uh, the column of group winners. But because, you know, for instance, I don't know if you take uh, Juventus and Barcelona, they were both, you see here in group D or Bayern Munich and Paris Saint-Germain, they were both in group B. So of course, one of the two will end up here in the in the right uh, column, the the column of runners up, and probably high up here, indeed, because they're. And uh, yes, yeah, so I I kind of agree with you that because nobody will pick, will really want to pick those teams. <laughs> if you're down there, 
it's 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 not good for you but uh at the same time it's also because you're down there right that's the that's the yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. point of uh rewarding like the best uh group winner so uh, yes if, the thing is that in in this in this uh, if you think of the tournament organizer you just kind of forget about like this idea of soccer powerhouse you just look at the results of the group stage that year and you're assuming that you know if you're a group winner that uh, you're probably better than the runner up and so you just want to reward the teams that are here and, and normally they would but the thing is that we know that indeed typically you have better teams that are in this uh, right hand side column and uh, just because we know the history of soccer and then in that case i agree with you that if you're down there then yeah you will not be rewarded but at the same time it's it's because you're down there yeah that's um, but again i think that and i really hope that ufa will change that with a better seeding system for the group stage there will be less of those soccer powerhouses probably here and it's so it, it would not be as bad for you know the teams that are that are down there on the on the left hand side uh like number six seven or eight okay, thanks. but your point is absolutely absolutely yeah. correct yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're going a bit over time here. I do about like to point out that at two, um, we are going to have the immemorial uh, session for uh, Stefan Kessen. Um, and of course, I don't want to keep anyone away from his or her lunch if it's lunchtime in your time zone. After all, I mean, you can do as if you're at home. You probably are at home. <laughs> Um, and, and leave the session whenever you want. We do have one uh, more question uh, here from uh, Juan. Um. Uh, hello. Yeah. Well, a very a very quick question because I know you are you are running out of time. Uh, I I I also have a, a big problem with this uh, proposal, and it's is is connected to the previous uh, presentation. Uh, the, 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 the important distinction uh, in a in a tournament design is to offer exciting games during the whole tournament, not not only in the final. So. Uh, the proposal you you give uh, 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 with the example you give uh, give very boring matches in the knockout uh, stage compared to the to the matches that we we saw in the European Champion League. This is this is my main concern with this approach. Uh, why why do you say that the games are boring well, in the in the knockout round? Well, we had the uh, Paris Saint Germain, Real Madrid. We have very, very exciting matches in the knockout stage, and now we have very, uh, very uh, easy matches. I don't really agree with you. Like, for instance, you were in that. I mean, of course, it all depends. But you, for instance, here you have Liverpool versus Bayern Munich. You have Roma versus Real Madrid. You have Barcelona versus Chelsea. So it's not so much about it. It's just because, like, those. So the reason here is that you see Roma. Um, Liverpool, Barcelona. The reason why you have those matches is that if you see Roma, Liverpool, Barcelona, they're in the second half of the group winners. So basically, they only they can only pick the the teams that have not picked have not not been picked before among the runners up and the ones that are that are strong, like those Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, and Chelsea. So so the I chose to to maximize the probability of winning. That's that's the point. Sorry, say it again. The matches are are chosen. To maximize mm -hmm. the probability of winning for the team that choose the match, that's yes. the problem. Uh, well, I agree, I agree, but at the same time, uh, you know, in the, it, it 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 doesn't end up really do. Well, I I understand your point, like like on a theoretical you know perspective, um, but uh, it's well, you know, I mean, it depends probably maybe on the sport, but like, for instance, with example, with soccer, well, like we know that, you know, chance plays such a big role that I wouldn't, yeah. It's just a matter of like, you know, um, let's say making making the the, the, the the tournament more fair, like globally, you know, by rewarding better, like the group stage performance, and also by, yeah, I agree that, that what is clear with this format is that it really maximizes win incentive during the group stage. Uh, well, win incentive is also, of course, maximized between the knockout stage because it's a knockout stage. If you lose, you're just you're just out. In the in things of interest of the game, what you have in mind is probably like you know balance of the the two teams uh, that play against each other. Um, 
I see your point. I see your point, but I I'm not so worried about it because like all the examples that I've taken, I also in the paper I have an example where actually uh, it's the full uh, uh, choice implementation where, for instance, basic tasks, <laughs> no offense again, could be picked, you know, by a team if uh, you know I don't know. For instance, here maybe uh, I don't know Manchester United prefers to pick a uh, basic task instead of Sevilla. Actually, it's still uh, well. I think it's still it 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 it's still very reasonable and anyway. Uh, you know, if maybe you think that in the round of 16, you don't have like such exciting games, maybe in the next round, you know, you will end up with only like, you know, the best eight teams and we'll have all the exciting games. So I I, I understand your point, but I, I don't see it as a as a as a bigger uh, issue, at least for in, in sports where there is no, no where chance plays a big role like soccer. But that's that's that, that's that's a good point. Too. I, I agree. It clearly maximizes win incentive during the group stage. It also maximizes win incentive during the knockout stage. But, but, but yeah, maybe in terms of, of interest of the game, you could argue that, you know, yeah, maybe those games are not so interesting. But would it be better to have, I don't know, like a Basel versus Besiktas? I don't know. It's true, maybe the two teams, Basel versus Besiktas, is clearly, probably, certainly not possible in my design. It would be possible in the current design because it's just a draw. Um, yeah, it, then it probably it, it depends on the taste of everyone. <laughs> okay, there is another question by uh, Jean-Louis. Uh, hi, uh, just a question about the global ranking of the 16 team coming from different group which have not interacted before. Oh, okay, sorry, so, can, can, you, can you say it again? I couldn't hear you yeah. well. Is there not a problem in your global ranking of the 16 team at the end of the group stage? Mm -hmm. uh, these teams are coming from different groups who have not played. Each yeah, other. against each other. No, no, yeah, no. That's... Yeah, so that's why I said that actually for, for this design to work well, you need to have like very well balanced groups. That's clear because, of course, if you have like you know a group where one team is extremely strong and then all the let's say for groups of four like three other teams are extremely weak then of course that's a big advantage for that team because it's very likely that they will finish you know best group winner because they just had like very weak opponents during the group stage so that was really my point and actually i see i actually see it as i mean i i i've, I've I, I, yeah i had to you know <laughs> go quite quite quick during the the talk, and I actually uh, listed it kind of here in the drawback uh, section, but I actually see it more as an as a benefit because actually it's it's actually very important in all in, in, in this case of tournament design that all the you know group says that all groups would, would be well balanced, and that actually yeah. if you if you adopt this design that would really force you to have groups that are well balanced because otherwise clearly it's a big advantage for you know yeah the teams that 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 is strong and that is that is in a, with opponents that are very weak or Quite weak in the in the in the group and that and, and precisely so yeah I didn't mention but so I mentioned like in my answer and I mentioned like the problem of the seeding of the group stage of the UEFA Champions League uh, since 2015 and it's actually it's 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 it, it, it's not good and also there were problem with the uh, the way uh, uh, the the FIFA World Cup draws work before uh, 2018 because of the poor pre 2018 uh, FIFA World Cup actually one of my solutions for the uh, yeah. For the FIFA World Cup was uh, adopted uh, by FIFA for the 2018 uh, World Cup, where actually they did not only enforce the geographic constraint but also the the the, the group uh, balance. And actually, indeed, the 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 eight groups at the 2018 World Cup were were much more balanced. So it's actually a very good point that you are making that indeed this requires groups that are very well balanced. And actually, I, I see it as a as a benefit because that forces. Uh, you know, tournament organizers to really enforce this. So we have to go back to the constitution of the group. Yeah. To change the way they are constituted. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions, then I propose to uh, conclude the discussion here. Um, well, I mean, there is the in memorial uh, session at uh, two. Uh, but that one will be in, in the other room, I guess. Um, well, James will correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. In the other room. So I'll close this room right away uh, and we'll move okay. to the other one. Okay. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks for uh, the discussion. And uh, see you later.
Thank you so much. Thank you all for your Thanks questions. Everyone. Interesting.